What's up, YouTube? This is Metallic TCG, and today we are coming at you with a deck profile for, as you can see, the Ur Dragon for the Commander format for currently June 2022. So, with this video, kind of like the Krenko Mob Boss deck profile, it's essentially going to be kind of like a before and after, since I'm going to be getting a lot of new support that has been recently released, because technically these decks are still kind of. A little bit in the pre-pandemic a little pose like a little mid-pandemic format so we're gonna jump into it if you're not subscribed to the channel definitely hit that subscribe button comment down below what kind of changes you would like to make to the deck and also what you're currently playing because i'm definitely very interested all right so we're gonna split the deck into two halves uh just to make it easier if these are 100 card decks so for those who are not familiar with the ur dragon it's a pretty straightforward deck it has an eminence trigger which as long as it's in the field or in the command zone other dragon spells you cost cost one colorless less and then whenever one or more of your dragons attack you can draw that many cards and then you can put a permanent from your hand onto the battlefield since we are playing dragons a lot of our cards are very high casting cost so this is just a really great way to get some card advantage as well as cheat out some really big dragons we are playing one copy of croesus of Herger. Honestly, it is pretty good, especially if you're facing off against like a mono deck or like, you know, a Muller, uh, multicolor deck that's like maybe two, because if you can be able to actually deal combat damage to the player, pay the two in the uh, the swamp, then you get to be able to basically look at their hand, get that card advantage information, but also makes them lose a lot of resources. We're playing one, Dramoka the Eternal. It has bolster. Whenever it attacks, you get to choose a creature with least toughness among creatures you control and put two plus one, one counters onto it honestly not too bad if this usually ever does trigger off you're gonna want to give it to some things you don't want to die really easily such as your reduction for mana for like your goblins and it's a pretty decent card teneb the harvester it's a cmc six with a six power six toughness uh whenever he deals combat damage you can pay two into a swamp and then if you do put a target creature from a graveyard onto your side of the field and notice how it says a graveyard this is actually a really good card because sometimes you may be facing off against those decks that really utilize their graveyard, and you can take either key pieces from them, or you can even just get some back really good dragons, especially if you use something like Scion of the Ur Dragon to send it to the grave to be able to get resource value later. We're playing one Ataka World Ender. Whenever a dragon you control strikes, it gets a double strike until the end of the turn. This is amazing just because we have certain things that, like, whenever it does combat damage, whenever they attack, so we get multiple triggers off of that and just get more value. Plus, again, a lot of our creatures are pretty big. So if we give them double strike, again, that's even more pressure to apply onto your opponents. We're playing one Dragonlord Atakara. When it enters the battlefield, you can deal five damage up to up to five target creatures in our plane walkers. So it's pretty good just for like, you know, kind of like, you know, pinging off certain things or just doing some damage. We're playing one Joda, the Archmage of Eternal. Joda is amazing because it combos off cards especially well for such as um, the Fist of the Suns and, of course, Morph on the Boundless. Basically, it allows us to be able to cheat all of our costing dragons to be able to just pay Wooburg. And what's amazing about that, we can essentially pay nothing to summon really big dragons, which is amazing because we have a lot of cards that allow us to get more value from dragons hitting the battlefield and just so on and so forth. Because we are playing cards such as, you know, uh, La Fissa Dragon Queen, along with, you know, Kindred Discovery. There's a lot of great cards in the deck for Synergy. We're playing one Bloodwing the Risen. Honestly, it's pretty good. Uh, it's a six, it's a seven. I can't do math. But technically, it's six with the uh, Ur Dragon. And when he enters the battlefield, you can just simply target a dragon permanent, add it back to the field. And also, you can pay a Swamp and a Mountain to be able to give dragon creatures a 1-1. One, one. Not too big deal, but... The Resurrection is pretty nice and a nice addition. We're playing one Skirt to the Valkus. When he enters the battlefield, you can deal X to number of creature or player equal to X amount of dragons you control. This can actually become player control really fast, especially if you have such cards like, you know, you Devara Health Kite or Lapis the Dragon Queen. We can make dragons pretty quickly in this deck. So having a big dragon and just, you know, playing for damage, really good. We're playing one Nico Bolas the Ravager. When you enter the battlefield, you can make each opponent discard a card, and you can also pay seven to transform him as well. To be honest, I never really get to the point where I can actually bring out Nico Wola, but it is really powerful because it gives you so many things you can do. You can, you know, draw two cards. 
You can deal 10 to a target creature player. You can put a target creature or planeswalker from the graveyard onto the battlefield. And of course, if we can luxuriously get to the alt, we can pretty much make it so our opponent only has one more turn. Very, very fun. But nonetheless, it is a pretty cheap dragon to drop. And also, making your opponents lose card advantage is pretty nice. The Broadmaid Dragon is basically a two-for-one dragon sort of thing. When it enters the battlefield, you can create another four-four four red dragon creature token with a flying. Again, not too bad. We're playing one Dragon Lord Uchitai. Has hex proof as long as it's untapped. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, we can look at the top card threes of our library, put one of them in our hand, and the rest in the bottom bar of border. So this is really good because it allows us to kind of filter through what we may see the next turn. And again, we do have cards such as Euro Dragon and other ways to draw into them. So if we use this ability to kind of essentially scry for three, we could see if it's worth having them there. And if not, we could just end up the bottom of the deck. Dragon Lord Sumgar. This is actually a pretty good card, especially in the late game. Whenever Dragon Lord Sumgar attacks, you can be able to target a creature your opponent controls or planeswalker and get access to it. Sometimes in the late game, you can find it where your opponent has like an unbreakable board or just a really threatening board. Be able to drop this card can be a great way to put you in good for races with the rest of the players and just make it so it's less threatening from one player. We're playing one Dragon Lord Servant. Again, it's just Dragon Spell Reduction. Nothing special about that one. Same thing with Dragon Speaker Shaman. Again, our dragons are pretty big. So if we could at least have one or two of these guys out, we're reducing at least two mana, sometimes three for the colorless casting. So it's really good. We're playing one New Moth the Devastator. It's a dragon name. Uh, personally, if I want to be an ass, I could always, you know, just blow up two target lands, but come on, this is Commander. We generally leave the lands alone. One Yutabara Hellkite. This card is amazing. So whenever you, a dragon control attacks, you can create a 6-6 six, six dragon red creature token with flying. Now, there are a few cards in here that were just recently added that make it even a little bit more disgusting, but it's great. It's great. Um, again, we're usually attacking with like five or six dragons, so we can be able to have some more tokens. That's going to trigger cards like Kindred Discovery, uh, Kodama. There's a lot of things that will be triggering at that point in time, and it's just so good. It's just really good. Uh, sure, being at eight, seven with, you know, the Ur Dragon is a bit pricey, but it definitely is what you get you what you pay for. And you can always cheat this card out with, like, Scion and the Ur-Dragon. Slumgar, the Drifting Death. This card's actually pretty cool. It's got a Hexproof, and whenever a Dragon Control attacks, creature your opponent's control get a negative one, negative one, until the end of the turn. So if we're having multiple dragons, you know, attacking, it's pretty good because we could just make sure that they get, you know, a little bit weaker and we could be a little bit more threatening. <clears throat> Deathbringer Regent. This card is pretty interesting. Um, It becomes a board wipe if you need it to. And if it doesn't, then, you know, it isn't. Um, but it is pretty good just to have that utility. Whenever he does it into the battlefield, he can cast it from your hand. If there are five more other creatures in the field, you blow up the board. Uh, typically, if I don't want to blow up the board, I'll just hold on to this in case it does become important. If not, you know, it, it, it's just nice as an option. Dragon Lord Kumuka, whatever. He pretty much gives all your dragons haste. Uh, again, it's a uh, secondary effect. doesn't really matter because we don't, we're playing commander, you know, singleton format. So... But again, giving them everybody him haste is really important. Ruse, the Falling Star, whenever he is put into the graveyard, it deals five damage to each creature without flying. It's essentially kind of like a weaker version of Blasphemous Act, but it doesn't really touch us too much because 99, like about 80% of our creatures have flying, if not even more. And even the ones that don't, they typically have a little bit more than five, so they can generally survive. Uh, Savage Ventimal. Whenever he attacks, you get to add uh, three green, three and red to your mana pool. And until the end of the phase, it does not empty from your mana pool as phase ends. Which is awesome because we do have some cards we could tap into and pay into it. To be able to get some value before the mana is gone. Such as Dragon's Ark and a few other cards as well. I also like Steel Hellkite. Yeah. So Steel Hellkite, it's a 6-5-5. Five, five. Uh, you can pay 2 to give it a plus 1. Or if you want to pay X, you can destroy each non-land permanent with converted mana cost. Uh, X whose controller was dealt combat damage by Steel Hellkite this turn. So again, there are, you know, different ways we have getting access to it, and this can also get rid of permanence, which is pretty powerful too. Uh, Yuchitai is Soul of Winter, so whenever Dragon Control attacks, tap a target non-land permanent and opponent controls. That target doesn't untap during its controller's next end step. That is actually pretty cool, because especially if you're playing against, like, you know, a deck that is very combo-heavy, like the Krenko Mob Boss, where they just need to tap stuff or untap stuff. Uh, putting it in a position where they have to be already tapped, not only does it slow them down, but if they have ways to, you know, circumvent the tapping, 
it causes them to have to use more resources to be able to go about that, which can put them in a bind, which is always nice. Slide of the Ur Dragon. This is basically anything you want it to be. It's really good. You can pay two, search your library for a dragon card, put it onto the graveyard. If you do, Scion becomes a copy of that card, and then shuffle your library. And you can do this multiple turns as, like, you can, you know, in response to something happening as well. But uh, Scion just already on the board is great. And then he can, like, you know, sell you Devour a Hellkite or something. And then he can just attack with it because Scion is still on the field that turn, too. So, again, Scion is really good. Morph on the Boundless. Honestly, this card is basically the secondary commander. Because it just works so well in any tribal deck. So you're going to choose Dragon, obviously. <laughs> Spells of the Chosen type you cast cost Wooberg less to cast. And this effect reduces the only amount of colored mana you pay. Plus it gives all your other dragons an additional 1-1. One, one. So again, if you're combining this off with cards. Such as Jota the Archmage Eternal. Or of course, Fist of the Suns for the artifacts. It allows you to basically cheat out dragons for free. For free. Uh, Lathis Dragon Queen. Again, this is a really powerful card because whenever another uh, non-token dragon enters the battlefield in control, you can create a 5-5 red dragon creature token. Again, more dragons. So good. Boneyard Scourge. Whenever a dragon creature you control dies, while it's in your graveyard, you can pay one close in a swamp and return to the battlefield to your graveyard. This is actually pretty cool because it always gives you an option to be able to drop a creature. It is at level... F uh, power is 4, so it can trigger things such as, like, you know... Um, that green enchantment, um, something bond. I'll, I'll, it'll come in the deck, but like it triggers some of our art, our enchantments, really gives more value, and of course protect ourselves in case we have nothing. Uh, Sun Scourge Regent. Uh, this actually gets pretty big really fast, especially if you're playing against in a four-player game. When you put a cast a spell, put a one-one counter on and gain a life. Love it. Tiamat. Yes, a relatively of a newer card. So when Tiamat enters the battlefield, if you cast, you can search your library for up to five dragons, not named Tiamat, and then add them to your hand. That's amazing. It only costs six in the deck, too. We get a 7-7 seven, seven by paying six. We also get to search five cards. Like, that is that is really good. Here's another card that I actually just recently threw into it. It actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's Kodama of the East Tree. So it has reach. You know, pretty cool. But also, when another permanent, it doesn't have to be a token, it can't, it can be a token. When another permanent enters the battlefield in your control, if it wasn't put on the battlefield this ability, you could put a permanent card with equal or lesser converted mania cost from your hand onto the battlefield. So again, the fact that we're just, you know, if we use like the Ur Dragon to cheat out a cheap, like a pretty big dragon, that's going to trigger Kodama and allow us to put down another permanent. And then again, with all the resurrection, just, you know, something that we do, it can just give us really good value. And again, it doesn't have to be the same type. It's just any permanent. So if we have, like, you know, Morphon, and of course, Jota onto the field, we can then, you know, cheat him onto the field. Kodama can trigger, and then we could choose to put either an artifact, an enchantment, or some other permanent with an equal or lesser converted mana cost onto the field. So essentially, we could just keep dropping cards and keep dropping cards. And if you combine that with cards such as uh, Kindred Discovery, we're going to be able to keep drawing, or if we use cards such as Tremor Ascendancy... We can keep drawing if we keep dropping creatures. So, Kodama, I haven't really done much testing with it, but it it makes sense. It just makes sense. We're also playing one copy of Dragon Lord Champion. Dragon Lord Champion is really good in the deck as well because whenever a source you control deals five or more damage to a player, draw a card. Nearly every drag we have is more than five. So, again, we attack, we get the draw. On to the enchantments. We have Kindred Discovery. Whenever a creature you control of the chosen type enters the battlefield or attacks, you draw a card. Again, basically choosing dragons. All of our dragons are in the deck and same with Changeling, so Kindred Discovery just makes sense. Next question would like that Kadama thing we mentioned. Descendant's Path. At the beginning of your upkeep, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a creature that shares the type of the creature you control, you may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Otherwise, put it at the bottom of your deck. So, the fact that we can kind of just cheap out dragons really quickly is really nice. Um, and again, even if it's a changeling, if like if we have like more fun on the field, any monster that we do reveal with this, whether it be one of our shaman goblins or you know, Joda, technically more fun's gonna match the same type with it, and we could just drop it. Ristic study. Uh, because I have the need to ask so many people if they're gonna pay the one. Again, dragons, we want to keep drawing, we wanna we wanna make sure we don't miss land drops. 
So having, you know, Ristic Study is going to be one step to get us there. Tremor and Ascendancy. Creatures you control have haste. Whenever you drop a creature with a power of four or more, we get to draw a card. Again, that also includes tokens, too. So, again, Tremor and is a great card for enabling faster plays and getting more card advantage. Uh, Elemental Bond. That's a card. So, Elemental Bond. A creature with a power three enters the battlefield under your control. Draw a card. Again, same thing. Rhythm of the Wild. Non-creature uh, type spells you control cannot be countered. And also, we get to have them riot, either giving them a plus one, plus one, or even giving them haste. Again, hasting is always really good. Dragon Tempest. Whenever a dragon enters the control of the battlefield, give it haste. Again, really good on its own right there, but it gets even better. When a dragon enters the battlefield you control, it deals X damage to a target creature or player where X equals the number of dragons you control. We can have a ton of dragons, so it's really nice. It's really nice. And it only costs two. Frontier Siege. Honestly, this is actually a pretty interesting card because depending on your matchup and how you're doing in the game when you cast this card, you can benefit from one of the separate effects as well. Uh, I typically will pay cons because I want to have more mana. More mana is just always nice for more options. But of course, you can also choose to declare dragon and basically make it fight whenever you drop a dragon onto the battlefield. So again, really, really good. Smothering Tides. Uh, whenever your opponent draws a card, the pair may pay two. If they don't, you have to create a token. Again, this is really, really, really nice. Um, again, we're playing really big, powerful dragons, so having access to more mana is always really nice. And especially when you get into the late game, when people really need to start making their plays, they're generally not going to pay the two, nor can they usually. Swift of Boots. Uh, giving the Herd Dragon haste and protection is really nice. Uh, if I had a copy of Lightning Greaves, I would replace that for this, but you know, it still gets the job done. Dragon Art. So this is an interesting card. Um, a lot of times it actually gets dropped off the Ur Dragon's effect anyway, but it's a uh, it's an artifact that costs five. You can tap and pay two, and put a multicolored creature into play from your hand. It doesn't have to be a dragon, just a multicolor. And our deck is full of those. Dragon Sword. Whenever dragon enters the battlefield, to put a gold counter onto it. Then you can tap and remove a gold counter to draw a card or to get one color mana. Uh, honestly, the drawing is really nice, and just playing dragons and benefiting it is really nice. Urza's Incubator, because we do not have enough mana reduction as it is. Uh, we're going to choose dragons by paying three one time, having this artifact on the board. It reduces the cost of our creatures by two to cast, which is awesome. We're also playing Soul Ring, because of course, this is Commander, you got to play Soul Ring. We're playing Felwar Stone, because again, we're playing a five color deck. We need access to multiple colors. This is one of the best ways to do it. Uh, Herald's Horn, great card. Not only does it give us cost reduction, but we can also, at the beginning of our library, look at the top card. If it's a creature of the chosen type, you may reveal it and put it to your hand. So sometimes we'll take a draw to dragon before we actually draw up. It's really strong. Uh, Commander Sphere, again, same mentality as uh, the Dragon's Horde. We have access to, you know, multiple colors. We can, because this can tap for our Commander's color identity, which is all five colors. And we can also sack it to draw a card. Fist of the Suns, uh, you may pay Wooberg for the mana cost rather than the spells in you play. So again, combining this with uh, Morphon is just so much fun. So much fun. And here's another interesting card, too. Mirror of the Forebears. I really like this card. So as it enters the battlefield, you can choose a creature type, and then you can tap, uh, pay one until the end turn it becomes a copy of that target creature, the chosen type, except for it's an artifact, in addition to its other types. So if you want to have multiple copies of a non-legendary dragon on the field, really good. Uh, I believe Yudabara Hellkite is not a legendary dragon, so that is really powerful. All right, so for the next half of the deck... Uh, this is also where the land, so this would pretty much be like the midway point. Uh, if you're still following this video so far, uh, type wiggles in chat <laughs> or comments. Sorry, I'm used to streaming on Twitch. All right. So we're also playing Chromatic Lantern. Lands you control have add one mana of any color to your mana pool. And we can also tap it itself for one color of any mana quote. Again, really good for fixing our mana, just making sure we have enough mana of the right type to summon what we want to type. Summon. Kanama's Reach, always good for just mana ramping. You know, you get to be able to add, grab two basic lands, because we do fairly a few basic lands. Add one to the battlefield, and then add one to our hand to make sure we don't miss our land drop next turn. Uh, Crux of Fate, it's a board wipe. You can either choose dragons or not choose dragons and destroy everything else. Really good card. Uh, Sky Shard Claim, again, same idea as Kanama's Reach. However, this card just works a little bit better because it's forest cards. It doesn't have to be... Basic, so you can choose one of your dual color lands, and also it puts them onto the battlefield untapped, so you can still benefit them and just keep playing them. Cultivate, I gotta say, I love this art too. Such a good card. 
Uh, Cultivate, it's pretty much the same thing as Kadama's uh, Reach, just not an Arcane. And also, this looks gorgeous. Decimate. One of the... That's such a good card. Uh, I can destroy target artifact, creature, enchantment, or land. Again, I know I did say that I prefer not to touch the lands, but sometimes you just gotta play the game. This is really good um, because you're just getting rid of so many problems on the board if there are them. And also, sometimes you can use this as a great politicking card, too. Time of Need. Search your library for a legendary creature, reveal it, and put it into your hand. Pretty straightforward. Farseek, again, ramping. And it doesn't have to be a basic, so we can search out one of our dual colored lands, so it's just really nice. Earthquake, it's uh, basically another form of board wipe that affects only creatures without flying and each player. So, again, just really nice to be able to play this card, cheap it out, get rid of the entire board beside our dragons, and just swing for a game. The only Planeswalker in this deck, uh, Sarkon Fireblood, you can either plus one, either discard a card and then draw a card. You can add two in any combination of colors and spend it for a dragon. Or we can go for his alt and then go for the four or five red, red dragons with flying. I never alt this guy. If anything, sometimes we will go for the draw, but honestly, we're just using it for the extra mana. Honestly. This would probably be a card I would cut out if I had to do any changes, but for now, he's good. So, for the lands, we're playing, I believe, 39 lands, but I might cut it down by one land uh, to make room for some new cards that I've actually ordered and plan on making an update to this deck with some of the new releases for the next set. So, be sure to subscribe to be able to see what happens. But, anyway, so we're playing one mountain, one island, plane. Oh, wait, another island. I lied to you all. A forest, a swamp. Basically, one of each except for Islands, because Islands a little bit lack lusting in the color, uh, mana fixing. But I wanted to have at least one of each, so cards such as, you know, Cultivate, Kodama's Reach are going to be live. So I want to make sure I can get the most that I can. And also have the different options, too, just depending on what's playing on. So for the most expensive, probably, in this entire deck, just being the land cost. Because I want to try to make this as, you know, as effective as I possibly could within my budget constraints. Cliff Top Retreats, if you have a mountain or plains, it enters untapped. Really good because it taps for red and white. Uh, Jungle Shrine, it adds all either as one of red, green, or white. Again, just really good. It's a little bit slow that it enters tap, but, you know, it's not the end of the world. We have a lot of other ways to fixate mana. Uh, Woodland Cemetery, it enters untapped unless we control a swamp or a forest. So good colors. Arcane Sanctum, uh, same thing, but it's blue, white, and black. Mystic Monastery. Again, we have the majority of the trio of the lands. I know recently they added a new set of lands that are very similar to these ones that also have the classification of Swamp, Plains, Mountain in the land subtype. So you can also search it off with like, you know, uh, like, you know, kind of like Farseek. But I, I just don't see the justification of spending the additional money for those cards. Like, sure, if they go a little bit cheaper, might swap them out. But for now, I'm fine with what we currently have. Mystic Monastery, like I mentioned. Uh, Crumbling Necropolis, so we can be able to search out for red, white, or I'm sorry, red, blue, and black. Overgrown Tomb, it's one of our shock lands. So if it enters the battlefield, you can pay two if we don't enter its tap. It does have the Swamp 4 side of category, so it does give us plenty of options to search it out. Same thing with Cinder Glade. Cinder Glade, though, typically this may end up being entering tapped just because we have so few basics anyway. But it's still a pretty good search nonetheless. Rootbound Crag, if entrance tapped, unless we control a mountain or a forest. Uh, Crystal, uh, I'm sorry, Haven of the Spear Dragon. We get to tap it to add one more mana pool, or we can add one of any color to spend it for a dragon spell only. You can also sacrifice it and pay two return target dragon creature or Ugin Planeswalker. Let me right right to your hand. So it's pretty good for recursion. Um, never really came up for the last effect, but it's still good to have it there as well. Uh, Glacier Fortress, again, same thing with the Hunter. You know, if you don't have a Plains or a Four Island, it enters untapped. Uh, Nomad Outpost, we get access to red, white, or black. Uh, Frontier of Bajovac, uh, again, a green, red, blue, enters tapped. Uh, Temple Garden, again, green and white is pretty important to the deck, especially with, like, the ramping section, so it is nice having this access to as well. Sandstep Citadel. Unclaimed Territory. Really good for a land for any tribal deck, honestly, that's multicolored. Uh, you either get to add a colorless, or we can add one man of any color to, you know, the creature toes, and we're going to choose dragon. Godless Shrine, again, a white-black duel, and entrance tapped unless you pay two. Temple of the False God, again, if we have up to five lands, we can tap this and add two. 
really good in the late game, really bad in your opening hand. Breeding pool, one of the better ones, honestly, just because green and blue is really important. Uh, and extra tapped, unless you pay two, you know, all that good stuff. Same thing with Blood Crypt. Blood Crypt is really good as well. One of the better lands, in my personal opinion. Uh, we have Cannon Slaw. Again, this is actually kind of interesting, too. It's one of the only cards we have that does cycling, uh, which sometimes it is nice, especially if you want to dig for certain creatures and stuff like that. If we have a very established board in Slate game, we already have a ton of mana. You know, cycling might be a little bit more easier and more something we might do, but generally we don't do it too often. Uh, Command Tower to give one of the, uh, any of the colors. Opulent Palace, again, access to be able to get the colors from green, black, and blue. Uh, Hinterland Harbor, enters tapped unless we have a forest or an island. Dragon Skull Summit, same thing, but Swamp or Mountain. Stamping Ground, our Shockland for the green, for the gruel. Uh, Savage Lands. Reflecting Pool, again, Reflecting Pool is always a pretty live card because we're playing one of each color. Um, well, we have all five colors, so if we, you know, can have three different players with three different decks again this just become whatever we really want it to be uh seaside citadel sun petal grove sacred foundry and sunken hollow and then finally path of ancestry path of ancestry is really good honestly because an interest tap sure that kind of sucks but when you add a mana pool to your uh commander's color identity when you mana is spent to cast your future spell that shares its type we get the scry one so be able to kind of like look through our deck and be able to see what we could possibly, I'm sorry, not the, through the deck, but uh, go through the top of our cards and be able to see if there's anything good. It's just really nice having the ability to scry, you know? Scry is always really good. And that is it. Again, I feel like these deck profiles take so long, but, you know, we have to take a little bit of time to kind of like explain my reasoning for certain choices and hopefully just to paint a decent picture. But that is the deck for now. I have a, quite a few cards actually coming in the mail from the newest set that I do want to update here for you all, so it has a little bit more fun places to do. Again, there's a lot of cards I would love to add to this deck to, like Old Gnawbone, but I'm not going to justify buying a $30 card at this point in time. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. Again, this is Metallic TCG signing off. Thank you so much for listening to me ramble about this for almost 30 minutes. Y'all have a wonderful day, and I will catch you in the next video. Peace.